So if you pay attention to the Vocaloid scene lately, or just Japanese music in general, you might have seen a name Wawaka floating around, and the buzz about his recent passing. His songs dominated the rankings on Nico Nico during April and May, and a number of articles covered his passing as well, not to mention the countless fan art that was made in remembrance of his songs. So today I wanted to talk about who Ozaki Wawaka was, and how one college student with seemingly no background in music theory changed Vocaloid forever. The year is 2009. The vocal ain't seen only an infant at the time, but I managed to find a call following due to the rapid success of Hasuni Miku. Not only that, but producers like KZ Lifetune and Dio would change the scene forever with songs like Melt and Last Night Goodnight, showing the world that Vocaloid not only had musical potential, but was here to stay. Their legacy among countless others now mentioned here would inspire garage band members and closet musicians to try their hands at the scene as well. One of these artists would be a young college student that went by the alias of Wawaka. Wawaka had been writing music since high school, and now in college he was part of a small band continuing his passion for music. He decided to join the Vocaloid scene after seeing the high quality songs that were being posted on Nico Nico. On May the 11th, 2009, he would launch his first song called In the Gray Area on the site. While the mixing was a bit rough around the edges, the fast paced drums combined with the simple looping piano melody and wavy synths in the background was nothing heard before on the site, and quickly garnered him a cult following. Though it wasn't until June the 16th that his career would really take off with the massively popular Tosen Pole. The song would quickly climb its way up to number 2 on the Nico Nico rankings within the week it came out. Some artists can only dream of hitting that high but Wawaka did it within a month. It was a song that was a clear result of the trials and errors he made with his previous tracks. It had the defined tuning of Ten no Hira, but the high energy beat showed and died untold. But Tosa and Po was more than a smash hit. It was a track to show Wawaka had finally found his voice as a musician, but that was only the beginning. From there, Wawaka would begin his legacy on top of the board. Shortly after that in August, he would launch one of the biggest songs of his career, Two Face Lovers. The song was a massive hit, jumping from 16th at its launch to first in the rankings after the following week, even beating out Two Breasts Walking by the hit producer Deco27, which launched that same week. While Two Face Lovers would lose his number one position the following week, the song would steadily remain within the top 30 for the remainder of the year. Only two months into his career, and the rookie producer suddenly found himself in the spotlight. Though only releasing a total of 11 songs during his two-year prime as a producer, his songs constantly garnered the attention of the community, and would seemingly always be smash hits. Rolling Girl, Unhappy Refrain, World's End Dance Hall, there seemed no end to what Wawaka could accomplish. Recently, Kenshi Yonisu, known by his alias of Hachi in the Vocaloid community, admitted that when World's End Dance Hall was released, he couldn't eat out of shock. Wawaka was not only influential in Nico Nico, but behind the scenes as well. In March of 2011, he joined eight popular producers to form a music label called Balloon, that focused on releasing Vocaloid music in a traditional music industry style, in order to help make the leap between the internet and the music industry a reality for some producers who can only dream of it. Wawaka would lead the charge with his first album, Unhappy Refrain. According to Wawaka, the album is a symbolic link for me between what's begun on the internet via Nico and was now branching out on the CDs. The album was a compilation of tracks Wawaka had made over the past two years, fully remastered and reworked with brand new tracks never heard.
Unhappy would frame would go on to be one of the most acclaimed and celebrated Vocaloid albums to ever be released. On the Vocaloid database, the only album that stands above it is Ryo's Supercell. During his career as a Vocaloid producer, Wawaka not only carried the workload as a producer, but as a member of a band as well, by choosing to keep his identity a secret from his bandmates that he was doing Vocaloid. But after the launch of Unhappy Refrain, he felt that he reached a peak with Vocaloid, and decided to leave Nico Nico to pursue a new career in the band scene of Hitorie, so ending the career of one of Vocaloid's best. If you look at the most popular songs of 2009, You'll notice that a lot of those songs follow a trend. Whether it's the ballads like Magnet, or the Shimensen inspired beats and whole release Rickshaw Saw and Carcasses, all those songs were very much paced out and had slow melodies. This isn't to say they were following a formula, if anything this was one of the most innovative eras of Vocaloid. It's just the beats were much slower. Just by doing some rough estimates by hand, I found that whole release Rickshaw Saw and Carcasses had a BPM around 80, while Magnet was a bit faster at 112. Now compare that to the 160 BPM of Two-Faced Lovers. When you look at it from that perspective, it's not hard to see why Wawaka grew as quickly as he did. There just wasn't anyone else doing what he was doing at the time. You have to remember there was no Omoi or Kenmu. Wawaka really was the floodgates for that chaotic energy in the scene. While I think people were drawn to Wawaka's unique approach to music, I also think they were drawn to the simplicity of it as well. You see he has this tendency in his music to place a basic beat within his songs, and then he builds off of that to create his piece. This can either be a basic piano melody like in Rolling Girl, or a synth like in Ten Sen Pole. And I think Rolling Girl is probably the best song to look at for this, because when you think about Rolling Girl, what's the most iconic part of that song? It's that piano melody you hear at the beginning, right? And then it gradually builds into this roar of noise. The piano is still there, but now you have these smashing drums layered on top of it. And eventually the guitar takes over during the verses. And you'll find a lot of his songs follow this format, and it's hard to ignore once you realize it. And I think that's what makes Wawaka's music such a hit after all this time. It's both basic and complex. That basic melody makes his songs extremely catchy and easy on the ears, but at the same time his ability to make all those hard-hitting notes work together to harmonize makes his music into this complex beauty that's hard to replicate. And Wawaka realizes this. He isn't just making fast-paced music to make fast-paced music. No, it's an art to him, because he knows how to control it. You see, he's really great at giving space within his songs, and he understands that sometimes less is more. I know it doesn't seem possible with music so fast and chaotic, but after a minute or so of listening to it, you gradually start to adjust to the flow of the music. So when he slows down the beat and strips back the instrumentals in songs like Boku no Sai no, it kind of makes you stop and think, holy crap, what did I just listen to? And then by that point, he'll throw you right back into it. He's always keeping you on your feet, and it almost feels like a current. There's a perfect harmony of push and pull. And that same aspect can also be reflected in another part of his songs as well, the endings. The majority of his songs end very abruptly. Now typically this is considered a poor choice when making a song, as it's very jarring for the listener. But in Wawaka's case, I think it's on purpose, and it's actually a strength. It plays back on that urge of staying on edge he instills leaving you with this sense of vertigo once the song is over. Almost like the girl on the cover of Unhappy Refrain, he wants us to experience this adrenaline rush of falling, and then to suddenly crash land with no warning, because in turn it makes you reflect on what you just listened to. Wawaka well, opened the floodgates for high BPM rock slash synth songs in the community. In the next few years, producers like Kenmu would make classics like A Tale of Six Trillion Years and A Night, and Gene would create Kagido Days. In the current age, that flag is carried by artists like Amoy, showing the impact and legacy Wawaka had on the community. Originally, I wanted to do this um, with a script, 
But no matter what I kept writing, I really couldn't just find the words to kind of like accurately express how I felt about what walk is passing. So I'm just going to do this off the top of my head and hopefully it comes off more genuine that way. So I really didn't realize how hard it was going to be to make a YouTube video and actually, until I actually started doing it. And kind of wanted that to show as a testament to how much like well, Waka meant to me as a music artist. He's just one of those people that like had such a big influence on my life and countless other people as well. I mean, the reason I made this video is because I knew that um, there was definitely people besides me out there who kind of felt this way about him. I can't remember like the last time I went to like an anime convention and I didn't see someone playing like a Wawaka song on Project Diva, you know? Pretty much, Wawaka was the first celebrity death in my life that actually kind of significantly impacted me. That's kind of a big deal for anyone out there who's ever had an experience like that because you feel like a part of you is kind of just gone or missing. I mean, I kind of remember how like my mom felt after Prince passed away or how my dad felt after um, David Bowie passed away. They were both just kind of depressed about it. And I didn't really understand it at the time. I was just like, you haven't met this person before. You have no idea who they even are. And, but yet you're upset about it. I just kind of really connect with it. I kind of, I guess I am now in their shoes now that someone significant to me has kind of passed away. So if I could ask you guys to just do one thing, do something to remember who Wawaka was. It doesn't have to be anything big. It could be listening to Unhappy Refrain this afternoon, or um, make a piece of fan art. But just do something that's meaningful to you to remember who Wawaka was. Thank you for watching. Hey, if I haven't scared you away yet and you're still here, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for watching. My name is Abna Master and I'm new to this whole um, YouTube thing, but I've wanted to make vocal aid um, video essays for quite a while now, and this was my first one, so hopefully it came out okay. If you have any suggestions on how I can improve, I would greatly appreciate it in the comments. Before I leave out, I want to get a special thanks to BG Person. This video honestly wouldn't have been possible without all the interviews that Kate's translated over the years. So, uh, thanks guys. I appreciate it. Bye.